All right, so today is uh, March 19th. I think it's the second last day of winter. And we continue with our journey here. All right. Sound is on, camera action, let's go. All right, so today's topic, we have two topics to, uh, to cover today. In uh, the first part of class, it's going to be uh, category cabling. So we'll just uh, take, a, take a little uh, peek at uh, what's happening in the CAT. Uh, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. Uh, and then after that, we are going to cover on, in, during the second part of this uh, of today's uh, lecture. We are going to cover specific uh, examples of well, examples of uh, systems. It's almost like a tasting platter uh, because there will be so much to cover. If I were to give you pretty much all that I can give you, uh, we would have to spend maybe a couple of months. Um, but uh, you're going to get uh, some sort of overview of what it is. And then if somebody is interested in uh, pursuing their career in this type of field, um, then uh, talk to me and I will, uh, uh, I will direct you further. All right. Okay. For the coaxial cable, like uh, what do we do at the bottom of the work order sheet? Um, at the bottom of the work order sheet, let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, I can go over this. Uh, just give me a sec here. Uh, would that be week one that we covered that? All right, here we go. All right, so at the bottom of the work order sheet, uh, this is uh, the bottom of the regular work order, and this is the coaxial cable. So you just enter the questions. Cable type, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's basically coaxial RG6U. So we got this one uh, done. And then uh, you're going to have to, uh, it, you don't need, um, you don't need the, meter to actually uh, estimate what the resistance should be. If there would be a piece of cable, let's say six feet of cable, uh, what the resistance would be if you had the, between this, uh, this outer shield and the center core, all right? That's what the resistance would be, not impedance, just the physical resistance, if you put it. Uh, based on the knowledge that you have right now, you should be able to guesstimate, or guesstimate uh, uh, you should be able to tell what the resistance should be. What should be the resistance between the center core on one end and the center core on the other end, if you have just a six foot of cable? Uh, what would be the resistance between the outer shield and the outer shield? Uh, just so you know the concept of the cable. It's a, it, there are a few simple questions there. Right? Uh, and that's basically, you're going to put those right here. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five questions to be answered, okay? So that's as far as the bottom of the, you know, now uh, some people forgot to print the, uh, the uh, proper work orders. Uh, now, if that's the case, then I'm still going to sign that for you. Uh, but uh, what you need to do is you need to print the proper work order at home and just fill out the bottom part uh, with the questions uh, just so you can get the marks. Right. So you're going to include an extra page and you don't have to fill all the rest of it on the second sheet, just the bottom part uh, where the questions are. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, let's see. All right, we got 37 people today. Uh, we're still recording. Yes, we're recording. We can start going with this. Okay. Cue it up and queue it up and queue it up uh, this is the category cabling that we're going to take a look at uh, so we just know what we're dealing with all right so category cabling imagine this is a uh, wire so first uh, concept of that okay imagine this is a wire now when uh, you imagine that uh, if you imagine that there is a um, 
current flowing through that uh, piece of wire, just a straight wire, okay? Uh, now the current is going to um, cause a uh, magnetic field to be present around the center and around the conductor. So it's basically just a wire with the current flowing through it. Uh, the direction of the magnetic field will be, or the electromagnetic field will be just like the corkscrew uh, for the wine. You, you crank this thing to the right and the corkscrew moves forward. So if the forward thing is uh, symbolizing the, you know, representing the current flow, then the, uh, the direction of the screw part of the screw corkscrew is going to uh, give you the direction of the electromagnetic field, okay? Now, forget that corkscrew, let's uh, go here. Now, we're going to position another uh, conductor right beside that, and that conductor is going to be not connected to anything. It's just going to be there. What is going to happen in that conductor, okay? Well, because uh, you, can, uh, you can have it both ways. The electric current is going to cause uh, an electromagnetic field uh, around the conductor. So um, if we place another, just a kind of a not connected to anything conductor within that electromagnetic field, that electromagnetic field is going to cause a current flow in that conductor, it's called induction. Okay. It's, uh, so the current is going to be caused by induction. So here's the concept, okay? So now we get to the point of uh, something that's called a crosstalk. Okay. Uh, crosstalk is something that is not really wanted in our, uh, in our field. Uh, uh, and I'll, um, we'll just uh, talk about why. Now, let's just, just get some definitions happening here. Crosstalk is a phenomenon by which a signal transmitted on one circuit or channel of the transmission system creates an undesired effect in another circuit or a channel. So if we have two pairs beside each other, and if there's a telephone conversation on one pair, then if there's another pair put right beside it, that conversation could bleed through due to induction uh, to the other pair. And if there's another conversation happening on the other pair, then that conversation could bleed through the other conversation. Right? So uh, it's an undesired effect. Uh, it's called a crosstalk. Now, uh, crosstalk is usually caused by an undesired capacitive and inductive or conductive coupling from one circuit to another. Okay. In structured cabling, electromagnetic interference from one pair to another. Now, in structured cabling, it could be a telephone cable or it could be a data cable. And remember in, uh, um, well, I'm just going to tell you. In uh, analog conversation, if there is uh, uh, crosstalk, it things might get a little annoying because you're going to hear somebody else's conversation. Right? But you still will be able to talk to whatever, whoever, whichever person you're talking to. So uh, you'll still be able to carry on, but you will be annoyed by the, it's just inconvenience. Right? Now, when it happens to a digit, uh, in a digital system, uh, digital system is a little bit different uh, because um, the digital transmission depends on sending ones and zeros uh, in a serial type of communication. And it's not the serial that you eat, it's a serial communication uh, that, uh, that uh, basically the, um, the bits are traveling and they are time aligned. Okay. So the receiver is looking for the bits, ones and zeros, to happen uh, at certain times. And based on when that pulse is happening, then, uh, and it's, it's, let's say there's going to be a packet of pulses, then the receiver is going to interpret that as data. 
Okay. Now, when you introduce some extra pulses there, then the receiver is just going to get confused and it's going to shut down because, uh, look, I'm getting a bunch of random pulses here. I don't know what, what this means. So I'm just going to shut down transmit the transmission. So in the digital systems, uh, the crosstalk is just going to basically shut down the transmission. It's going to be a complete, complete transmission failure. While in analog system, uh, it's going to uh, cause just annoying interference. Okay? Wink, wink. Okay. Uh, all right. Crosstalk in analog. So we're just going to visualize what I just said. Let's say there's one conversation happening uh, between two very pleasant people. And then there's another conversation happening by another pair of another uh, couple of present pleasant people. And if the uh, if the cables are running beside each other in close proximity, uh, in a way that one pair is able to affect the other, then the crosstalk is going to happen, and uh, uh, that is uh, going to cause an annoying interference in an analog system, in an analog transmission. Also, uh, this is not just a telephone uh, conversation. It could be a TV signal that's transmitted through the air in an analog form, uh, or it could be just, uh, or it could be radio, uh, audio transmission um, also, okay? Uh, in an analog form. So here is a cross dot now, when you download this uh, PDF version of this, um, um, of this lecture, I encourage you to click on this here, and there is a crosstalk problems with unshielded twisted pair cabling. Um, now, that's that's uh, when you watch this uh, YouTube link. It's a suggested YouTube link. Uh, you are going to see the basically how uh, what happens when you have crosstalk that's happening in the uh, uh, digital uh, transmission. Okay. Now. Uh, Somebody might say, yeah, okay, but uh, it doesn't mean that we have to separate the, every cable, a data cable from the other uh, by certain distance. No, this is an extreme case uh, when the signal is strong and uh, it's just visualizing the trunk. But yes, of course, we're going to have bundles of cables happening uh, uh, through raceways and in the walls, and they are basically in bundles of 100, 200, sometimes 600 cables. Uh, so uh, yeah, the the the, the crosstalk is going to be certain, a certain amount, but not enough to affect the other pairs. And how do we get rid of the crosstalk in our uh, in our transmission? Is by introducing a twist to the cable, right? to the pair. So pairs are twisted. Pairs are oh, there. I am. You got twisted pair. Okay, let's just uh, go back a little bit, uh, recap. Let's say we have two straight pairs going beside each other, just traveling beside each other. So there's a straight pair and there's a straight pair. Now, if you put them beside each other, uh, the, um, the electromagnetic field is going to have enough opportunity to build in a straight piece of wire right? or a pair that is not twisted. And then if you put another pair beside it, you're going to have enough proximity over enough distance that one cable can affect the other. Right? But if you twist that pair, you are dispersing that electromagnetic field. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have opportunity to build up constantly. So it's dispersing. Uh, so uh, then, uh, then you put another twisted pair uh, beside the other one, and if you, uh, and even if you, then on top of that, you're going to twist that pair at a different rate. So the cables, those those pairs, are not going to have enough proximity and enough in, enough strength to cause enough induction because the field is basically dispersed, and the other one is not going to be able to pick up enough. So twist is the is the uh, is the way twisting the pairs is the way to get rid of the uh, of the crosstalk. Yeah. or to remedy the crosstalk. All right. Now, when it comes to uh, 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 cabling, we're going to take a look at something that's called a UTP. And you see the first word. That means unshielded, twisted 
pair. What does that mean? That means that there is a jacketing covering all the pairs and the pairs are placed beside each other inside the cable. And they are twisted at a different rate for the reason that I just uh, talked to you about. Uh, and there are pairs. So it's an unshielded twisted pair UTP cable. There is no shield, there is no braiding. Remember when we did the, with the coaxial cable, there is a shielding, there's a braid. So one of the, uh, the outer conductor is also acting as a shield to, uh, to protect the signal from escaping uh, and interfering with other, uh, causing interference in other cables, or uh, also the, uh, the shield is protecting the in inner conductor from receiving interference from outside. But this is an unshielded twisted pair. Now you can tell um, that this is CAT6 because it does have that separator here. CAT5E will not have that separator, that, that, that inside uh, separator here. So the pairs are not twisted, not only twisted around themselves, but they're also uh, uh, in, in a way, they're also twisted around each other by this separator here. Now, uh, okay, I see, I think uh, similar things are done to long distance power transmission lines. They're crossed at certain distance uh, along the run, balance out the effects of reactive components. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, so for, for analog thing. Um, all right, so that's the unshielded twisted pair. The purpose of the twist, we just uh, uh, we just uh, covered that, is to eliminate eliminate the crosstalk between the pairs. Okay. Now we're going to go over a something that's called a shielded twisted pair, All right? And that looks like this, All right? So there is a foil shielding going around each pair here, and then there's a drain wire that also has to be connected uh, in a specific way to the connector on one side and on the other side. All right, uh, although UTP cable is the least expensive cable, it might be susceptible to radio and electrical frequency interference. It should not be too close to electric motors, fluorescent lights, etc. cetera. Um, in presence of high interference, shielded twisted pair might be uh, my might, uh, might have to be used. Uh, so when it comes when it comes to um, uh, just a regular Ethernet uh, type of installation, uh, your bread and butter is going to be the UTP, the unshielded twisted pair, and for the most part, still uh, Cat five E is being uh, used. All right. Uh, now, um, CAT6 is becoming more and more popular by every year that passes. So uh, CAT6 is going to be maybe something that's going to be replacing the CAT5E. However, CAT5E was today, uh, you know, 2021, CAT5E is still strong as the, as I said, bread and butter of the ethernet business. Uh, most of the systems require minimum of CAT 5E. And then uh, also we're going to look at uh, the specifications of different categories. You're going to see why CAT 5E is still the most used uh, cable here, depending on the distance as well. All right. Now, uh, when it comes to um, installing things around the industrial environment, so the Unshielded twisted pair would be used in the buildings uh, where there is not too much interference going on uh, in walls, in the ceiling. Just have to remember that uh, whenever you're running the cables in the ceiling or whatever space, uh, you have to keep them away as much as possible from things like fluorescent lights or any kind of electronic equipment that is... Um, that is there, right? especially from the thermostat wires and especially from the security wires because the thermostat wires or the HVAC uh, uh, and the security wires are some of the most noisy type of cables uh, that are in there. Uh, so basically, uh, keep it about uh, you know 
try to keep about a foot away from uh, fluorescent lights and anything that um, uh, that buzzes. Uh, later on, when you when you're using something that's called a toner, which will which we'll cover at later lectures, you can actually take the probe of a toner, put it on audio and go and, and just have, move it closer to any kind of electronic equipment and you're going to hear the noise that it produces, right? Uh, so, and, but when it happens, uh, when, it, when it comes to installing um, cables in the industrial environment, uh, you're going to have to install, most of the time, you're going to have to install uh, shielded, twisted pair. So this is in the kind of control equipment or whatnot. I remember a few years back, um, I was working, uh, I was contracting uh, with another company and we got a lot of uh, installations in um, industrial plants. One of them was uh, one of the parcel uh, um, carriers and that uh, the sorting plant where the, where the parcels are being sorted, most of them are not being sorted by hand. It's just automatically with the con all kinds of conveyor belts, sensors, actuators, pushers, whatnot, uh, and those uh, and, and electric motors. Uh, then all of those machines, they, they do produce electronic interference uh, or electromagnetic interference. Uh, so, uh, but uh, they also need to be controlled. And what do we need? To, what do we control them by? Most of the stuff is controlled by Ethernet type of a system. Uh, so, um, uh, in that case, shielded twisted pair had to be used uh, when we had to pull those wires. Also, if there is some longer runs uh, in the wireless access points that are mounted on the side of the buildings, uh, like big department stores. Uh, most of the time you're going to see a shielded twisted pair specified to be used. Okay. Now let's keep going with the shielded twisted pair. Shielded twisted pair is available in different, uh, in three different configurations. Uh, one is that each pair of the wire is individually twist, uh, shielded with a foil. So that's this case here. Or there could be um there's a foil or braided shield inside the jacket covering all the pairs as a group okay or sometimes you're going to have both you're going to have all of the cables or the pairs individually shielded and then on top of that there's going to be another shield so that's a heavy heavy shielding there and but the cables are like that of course they're going to be more expensive as a cable and uh, all the paraphernalia as jacket and the jacks are going to be more expensive as well because they cost more to produce all right now this here this little table here you may want to um, you may want to keep this uh, keep a good copy of this uh, so you can build on. We're just going to analyze a little bit uh, here uh, what's happening. All right. So when we have the Cat Five, which is pretty much obsolete by now, but we just still listed that just so to have some sort of comparison reference to other things. Uh, so CAT5, category five, uh, the American wiring gauge. So the gauge of each conductor would be 24 gauge. Okay? And it does have a twist. It does have a certain amount of twist. Now the transfer speed, now we have transfer speed and the bandwidth here. Transfer speed is pretty much the same as the bandwidth. And we're going, to, we're going to explain this thing as we go along. The maximum length of that is 300 feet. It is obsolete and not used anymore, right? Now let's see here, CAT5E. Also the gauge of each conductor is uh, 24 gauge. Now the transfer speed is one gigabyte, sorry, I'm not going to say one gigabyte, one uh, gigabit per second, because uh, when we talk about uh, transferring speed, um, uh, we're going to talk about bits per second. And we, when we're talking about storage, we're talking about bytes. 
Right? Now, uh, so it's one gigabit per second. Also, the maximum length end to end of a uh, Cat five E link would be three hundred feet. Okay. Now uh, the bandwidth is hundred megahertz CCA and three hundred fifty megahertz BC. What is that mean? What does that mean here? What's CCA, what's BC? I'm just going to flip to the other slide. No, I don't have that here. No, that's the end here. Come on. All right. Uh, CCA is something that's called a copper cladded aluminum. Copper cladded aluminum is basically the conductor is made of made of aluminum and it's just cladded which means basically it's covered with with copper the reason for that is money okay saving costs of production uh, now uh, when uh, you see uh, the bc that is uh, bare copper doesn't mean it doesn't have, there's no jacketing around it. Yes, there's jacketing around it, but it's basically the whole conductor is made of copper. Of course, uh, now you can see the bandwidth that uh, this uh, cable is capable of, 250 megahertz uh, of copper cladded aluminum and 500 megahertz of bare copper. Now, you can see the difference between bandwidth and the transfer speed. They're different. There's one gigabit per second up to 300 feet with cut six. And you can get 10 gigabits per second, but only up to 180 feet. So here's a little uh, twist to the twisted pair. All right? um, if somebody requests CAT6 to be installed in their building, you might want to check the distances and talk to the client and say, okay, so how long are your runs end to end? And 180 feet is not that much because remember you have to run the cables from the rack location. You're going to have a little bit of a service loop so you can have something to work with when you need extra piece of cable. Uh, and then you're going to run this thing right up to the ceiling, in the ceiling, down the walls, maybe somewhere else. So the, all the distances, they add, okay? So it doesn't take much to have 180 feet. However, there are some, uh, there are some runs that are 180 feet or less. Then installing CAT6 makes sense and paying extra money for the CAT6 cable uh, to be installed. Now, if you have most of the runs that are going to be 200 feet plus or more than 180 feet, it just doesn't make sense to pay for extra money to get uh, the CAT6 cabling installed because you're not getting the CAT6 benefits. Right? You just basically having just like as if you have if you had the uh, CAT5E uh, cabling installed. All right. Because look, CAT5E up to 300 feet, and that's 300 feet is the pretty much the most you can get out of uh, Ethernet cabling end to end uh, uh, so basically you have one gigabit with cat 5 e yeah? or if you install cat 6 but longer runs than 180 feet now what's the difference between the bandwidth and the transfer speed bandwidth is the ability to carry an analog signal so how high can you go with the signal before the signal is being lost in the cable. The cable cannot handle the higher frequencies anymore. Um, how much, uh, then how many channels, analog channels can you fit into that cable? Remember the frequency division multiplexing or time division multiplexing that we were talking about. Right? Uh, now, why do we list the bandwidth? Well, uh, because uh, 
when it comes to Ethernet, the inside wiring, when it comes from the modem, uh, and modem stands for modulate and demodulate. So it goes uh, to the digital signal from here to inside the building and from here to the outside of the building, the modem is dealing with the analog signal. So the internet from the outside is in an analog form, just like the radio transmission. And it transfers, modulates and demodulates modem. That's, the, uh, that's, that's how the acronym became. Uh, and then, um, um, then it transfers that to the digital signals. Now, the digital signal is just a bunch of pulses, and uh, that is being pushed to the limit. So first, you're going to get some nice and square pulse. But then again, uh, if you just push it to the limit, that uh, you're going to improve the ability to understand the pulses by the receiver. And then you're going to crank up the speed of the transmission and the pulses are not going to be as square as they used to be. They're going to look more like spikes and they're going to get smaller and smaller to the point that they're going to be comparable with the noise level. And you're going to push it to the limit uh, of how far you can push that envelope so the receiver still is able to receive those pulses. Okay? So that's why we can get different transfer speed of the ethernet side than the bandwidth because bandwidth is um, the analog type of a signal right. now uh, so then we go to cat 6a right it's a thicker cable now you can see from cat 6 uh, from cat 6 on you're going to see the gauge of the conductors uh, to get thicker because the number of the gauge goes higher uh, so that means that the wire is getting thicker or the conductor is getting thicker. Uh, so then the twist is getting tighter. See, as we go along and we increase the category number, here's a bit of a twist, just a regular twist. Cat 5 e is getting tighter twist. Cat 6, even tighter twist than Cat 6A. Now, Cat 6A is capable of delivering 10 gigabits per second up to 300 feet. Okay? And then you're going to have 500 megahertz of uh, ability of transmitting an analog signal and still being understood at both, <coughs> as soon as being understood uh, when it's transmitting from one end to the other, uh, when it has 500 megahertz, okay? And then 10 gigabits per second. Uh, then we're talking about CAT7, uh, then, uh, you know, the difference between CAT6, A, and CAT7 within the, if you're just talking about the digital uh, signal uh, within the Ethernet, it doesn't make that much difference because it also is able to uh, transmit uh, digital signals uh, up to 10 gigabits per second. Um, and uh, on and that across the whole length uh, spectrum, if you will, uh, I shouldn't use the word spectrum with the length, across the whole uh, length capability. Uh, and it is, uh, but then it just makes a difference uh, when it comes to bandwidth, uh, you know, with analog, analog signals. Then cut 7A, the twist is getting tighter and it's capable of transmitting 40 gigabits up to 160 feet, all right? So here is the 300 feet kind of, that's where it's broken, okay? The most you can get up to CAT7 is 300 feet, but CAT7A uh, is still going to transmit the signal, but it's not going to be uh, 40 gigabits per second. So up to 160 feet, you can get 40, and only up to 50 feet end to end, you're going to be able to get 100 gigabits per second with CAT 7A, right? So the distances do play a role when you're planning uh, the infrastructure or the network cabling installation. Okay? Uh, CAT, uh, CAT 8, uh, uh, it's not that widely used. Uh, and I'll tell you why, you know, here's 40 gigabits per second, 300 feet, 200 mega, megahertz, or like, or, sorry, 2000 megahertz. Why did I say 200, uh, sorry, why did I say 2000 megahertz? Because in the communications, um, 
it just so happened that uh, people were talking megahertz. Okay, numbers and megahertz, megahertz, megahertz. But yes, 2000 megahertz is two gigahertz. And when it comes to analog transmission, um, why is CAT8 not as widely used? Because uh, it, is, it is expensive. And for the price of that, and uh, for the specifications, when it comes to going anywhere over CAT 6A, pretty much, then you might as well use fiber, you know, fiber optics. Uh, so then the usage or application, uh, CAT5 is pretty much obsolete. Uh, CAT5e, home, small offices and commercial use. And then CAT6, CAT6a, mostly commercial, although some people, um, when they build new houses and they want to get a good um, network infrastructure, a lot of people install their um, um, CAT, uh, they want to CAT6. Just, in my, just have to remember that CAT6 is more expensive, but it's not just the cable you're talking about. It, you also need to get, if you get a patch panel, because uh, you're not going to get a bunch of jacks if you have outlets all over the place in your house, and you're going to uh, go to the other end where everything home runs to, the, to one point. It's just so much neater to install a patch panel, and now you know how to uh, terminate that. Uh, actually, half of us know how to terminate the patch panel right now. And the other half is going to be next week. Uh, so um, uh, <clears throat> the patch panels are more expensive because they have to be designed to accommodate the transfer speed and the specifications of CAT6. And of course, the jacks, the wall jacks, uh, they also have to be more expensive because they have to be accommodating the transfer speed and the bandwidth of that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, that doesn't mean if you just have the patch panel and jacks, um, uh, specified for to cut six, it has to be properly installed. And what is the one of the most thing that I actually try to pound into your heads when we're doing the labs? Uh, it is keeping the keeping the twist. Okay, the twist. It is extremely important that the twist of each pair is kept right to the very point where the connection happens, where the punch happens. Uh, it's CAT5E is going to forgive you a little bit. CAT6 and up, pretty much unforgiving. If you have not enough twist, if you untwist it even slightly, uh, you're going to have the specifications of CAT5E not cut six, right? So it not only uh, it takes more uh, um, more money to spend on the equipment, but it also takes a little bit more skills, uh, more skill to um, uh, to install that. And on top of that, right, you just have to make sure that the cables are not strapped with the zip ties, because if you if you strap uh, cut six with the zip tie you are changing, you're compromising the physical structure of the cable itself. And when you do that, excuse me, it's almost like um, not keeping the twist, right? And then if, uh, if you have too much band radius on that, so I'm talking about uh, kinks, okay? Sometimes uh, you run a cable and it just kind of loops itself around and you pull it and it causes a kink. Then when you take the king and you just kind of undo it and massage it a little bit and just kind of think, no, it's not good anymore. It's not cut six anymore. Right? So uh, it is very, very, uh, uh, it, it, it's a fragile thing to install cut six, right? You can't, you know, you just lay this thing on the top, on, on the floor. If somebody who steps on it will walk by on it. Uh, you don't have cut six anymore, right? It's not going, it's going to uh, pass uh, the wire map test it's going to pass the certification test up to CAT 5E, but if somebody is paying for, if the client is paying and requesting CAT 6, they are going to request the certification of each connection up to CAT 6 standards. And this is basically what this table um, is telling us here. Right? So this is uh, basically the, uh, the spiel on, uh, on the... Um, on the category cable. Uh, in the later lectures, we're going to, um, in the later lectures, we are going 
to talk about some sort of installation techniques um, that uh, that uh, that are going to, that is going to um, enable you to install things properly. Um, but we're not going to do I'm just giving you the reasons right now why the cable should be installed properly, why you should keep the twist, and so on. And then, uh, of course, uh, the importance of filling out the paperwork. Uh, so it's all coming together, uh, together right now. So you're getting uh, a lot of quote unquote the why. And then uh, later on, and during the labs, we're showing you the how. And of course, at uh, it's a couple of last lectures, we're going to give a little bit of a rundown on how things are being installed. Okay, uh, we're making a pretty good time right now. In okay, there's a question: in fiber, better or worse? Can then cut six? Is okay. Is fiber better or worse than cut six as far as being fragile? Huh, you know what? That's a, that's a pretty interesting question because they're both fragile, but each in their own way. Right? Mm. They're both extremely fragile when it comes to physical uh, damage. Right? Now, when you um, when you got when you have tail end of uh, of cat six. And you kind of hit it on something, uh, it's going to forgive you a little bit more, although it's not going to like it. Um, CAT6 is going to be more susceptible to magnetic interference, electromagnetic interference. Fiber, you can ride right, or you can run right beside something that's making a lot of noise when it comes to electronically, and the fiber is not going to be affected because there's no electric current flowing through the fiber optic, it's just light, right? So, uh, so there's the advantage of that. And um, uh, the disadvantage still, if you can call it a disadvantage, when it comes to, um, um, to fiber versus copper, um, is that uh, fiber is really, really, really sensitive to any sort of dirt in the air or environment. So dust and so on, that should be really um, taken care of because the, just a little piece of dust, if it goes to the core there, um, or some of the core of the fiber, op op optical fiber, uh, it would be like six micrometers, right? That's six of one millionth of a meter. So here's a meter. Right, uh, divided by million, and then multiplied by six times. You're going to have something that is really close to um, uh, to that's comparable to the dust. Um, also, still uh, the equipment that's being used for the fiber optics is still a little bit more expensive than the copper. So you know, is one better than the other? It depends on the situation. It depends what you look. Uh, depend on the, depends on the angle. Um, um, depends on the angle that you're looking at. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, who's IP? Do we have somebody with IP? I don't know. Or are we talking of internet provider? Um, right, no problem. You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, as far as you know. Uh, yeah, so that just remember the uh, CCA stands for copper cladded aluminum, and BC stands for copper. Now, um, that's pretty much as far as I want to give you uh, as the, when it comes to the category cabling. Now we're going to switch to uh, the other part. We still um, now we're making the we're making pretty good time. So, do you guys want to take a break right now? Let's say uh, ten minutes and come back uh, and, and and get the fire alarm, security alarm, and the surveillance. We can take a let's take a ten minute break. So, what do we have on 
we have 1245 let's uh let's just meet here uh exactly five to one and we're going to continue with the with the other half of this lecture okay 10 minutes
Okay, uh, so uh, we're going to continue on. Uh, it's five to one. Welcome back. We're going to continue with the, some of the uh, bread and butter uh, part of uh, what you might want to encounter if you get yourself hired in the um, IT business or telecommunications or the structure cabling business. Okay? Now, uh, we're going to talk about security systems, fire systems, and surveillance systems. Surveillance is basically the security cameras, okay? Security, uh, we're talking about the security alarms. Uh, here, we're talking about the fire alarms. And uh, here is the uh, surveillance. Uh, these are the, aside from, um, aside from just running and installing uh, computer networks or the ethernet uh, cabling, you are going to also uh, have opportunity to go um, maybe to security business uh, or the other, or the other parts, okay? uh, fire or surveillance. Now, when it comes to, first we're going to take a, take a look at the security alarms. Now, when you download the uh, PDF version of this, you are going to um, uh, um, uh, be able to click on these links. Uh, these are just going to give you some sort of uh, idea on uh, how, uh, you know, how the... Uh, um, it's going to give you some idea on how those things are being installed and how they are run, how they're going to uh, run. Okay. Now let's take a look. Uh, take a little bit closer look at the security alarms. Okay. This is uh, an example of a main board for a security alarm. Okay. And we're going to take a little bit, bit by bit uh, in analyzing what type of connections you might encounter when you're dealing with the security alarms, okay? Uh, now, um, security alarms, main board connections. So this uh, over here, we are going to take, uh, first we're going to concentrate on this part of the connections. And there are screw terminals, all right? Now, over here, what we have is the AC connect connection here. So this is the power. That's how the security alarm gets uh, power. The security panel gets its power. Uh, so it operates, okay? And uh, usually it is, uh, ru it runs basically out of the, the bell transformer, the doorbell transformer, uh, about 18 volts, AC, 60 Hertz, uh, now, there are two types of the transformers. Uh, some of them are the plug-in transformers that you have the, uh, the like a box with the prongs and you plug this thing in right onto the, uh, onto the outlet and you have screw terminals and then you just run it into the, you run, run the cable right into the, um, uh, the, um, the uh, AC part of that, okay? Uh, or you can have something that's called a wire-in transformer, and the wire-in uh, transformer uh, it just looks like um, it just looks like this here, like that here, right? And over here you have the 120 volt uh, AC uh, circuits here, and over here uh, you have the excuse me, the wires coming like 18, um, 18 volts uh, AC as well, all right? So it's just a step down transformer. Now, the thing is that uh, this here also has uh, some mounting rings on that with the, with the lock nut, and you can just mount this thing right onto the knockout uh, of electrical panel, okay? And you can wire this thing right into the circuit breaker. Uh, the the plug-in transformer is it's a, basically it's a box uh, just like that with prongs uh, and over here you have screw terminals. Out of that you're getting the hundred sorry eighteen volts AC right here AC 
uh, and uh, over here you plug it in uh, to the to the outlet 120 volts uh, AC okay now this thing here is fused inside so the problem with that sometimes is um, that uh, once you short these two by accident if you short these two for even a split second this thing basically becomes useless because this you cannot take apart all right now when you are uh, short these uh, it might hold for just you know a few more seconds before and or a couple seconds or maybe one second uh, and it's going to trip the circuit breaker right and then you can just uh, see what you've done maybe you have short shortened this thing by because the short by accident or so something like that this thing is still good you go and uh, unflip the circuit breaker uh, and you still have that uh, you know so if you are in the security business it's uh, always a good idea to have a few of those in your uh, in your in your working van uh, in your stash so uh, don't just go with one of those because sometimes you're going to have those wire in transformers that you're going to um, 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 be able to wire into the electrical panel, but sometimes you just won't have that ability to do that, and uh, you're going to have an uh, AC uh, plug uh, or uh, AC jack uh, provided uh, for you at wherever you're going to install the fire uh, security alarm panel, uh, and then you're going to have to use the plug-in transformer. Right, so. Uh, uh, so that's basically uh, the idea of those uh, of those two. Okay. Now, go back to this thing here. Next couple of uh, terminals is uh, plus and minus bell. The bell circuit is uh, basically a siren. It's a siren. Mm -hmm. Siren is a device that makes noise. Uh, sometimes, uh, or most of the time, you will want a security alarm to make a noise when it trips uh, to scare off the burglar or whoever breaks in and you, know, you don't want them to be there. Uh, so there is that uh, siren. Um, now that provides, when the security alarm trips, uh, it provides 12 volts DC and there are sirens or bells, they're called bells, but they're basically, it's a siren. It looks like a, it looks like a horn, like a speaker horn, okay? Uh, but uh, to the loudspeaker horn, you apply audio signal to make that sound. And the other, uh, the bell uh, that looks like a horn, uh, well, it, it does have that cone shape. Uh, it don't connect audio signal. It produces its own audio signal upon uh, providing 12 volts DC onto it. And it's, uh, it's optimized for the most annoying sound for the for the human ear you're not supposed to be able to think when that thing is going off all right or just letting you know and cut through the distance and maybe some other noise uh, in the factory or something like that okay? so that's the thing now here we have something that's called a program uh, uh, program um, terminals those uh, depending on the system but most of the time you're going to see that this is going to provide a ground reference. Uh, so if you have something connected to the 12 volt DC, this uh, once the program uh, terminal is programmed and it can be programmed to different things. It could be following uh, uh, some input. Uh, if something happens, then the program uh, terminal could be programmed to, uh, to activate, all right? Um, then you have the common uh, terminal, and we'll take uh, take a look at. Uh, uh, or uh, you know, in this case here, this thing uh, might actually provide 12 volt DC, and the other side is going to be connected to common, or uh, uh, depending on the system, it might provide you a ground reference uh, while this thing is connected uh, to a to the positive side or something. Different systems have different uh, uh, different ways of solving the program uh, buttons here. The program terminals, the purpose basically is to react certain way to a certain type of condition of something that is connected. And it could be uh, um, different various devices connected to the to the alarm panel. Now we have the relay here, all right? A relay, uh, we know what relay is, but uh, if we don't know what relay is, relay is an electromagnetic switch. So on one side uh, of a relay, you have um, coil 
or inductor. And over here, you have a switch. Okay. And that switch usually it's flipped. So what uh, one way. So here will be a common side of that. And this would be normally closed terminal. And this would be normally open terminal. And this is a dry contact here. Those two are physically separated. If you provide, let's say, DC, uh, DC voltage here onto the terminals of the electromagnet, that might cause the switch to operate one way or the other. And there are relays that are, uh, when they are not triggered, they could be normally closed. And when you apply the, the power to the electromagnet, it flips to the normally, uh, to, to this one here. So over here, you're going to have some couple of wires, and this could be connected to some sort of a power supply and to some sort of a device and that switch is going to operate that device. Or sometimes you want this thing to be normally closed. So when you apply the signal uh, to the relay, uh, then uh, the this thing is going to the, the the switch is going to flip onto the norm to the other side. So that normally closed terminal is going to be to open and it's going to break the circuit. All right. So uh, also, if you notice, uh, this is right beside the programs. Uh, right beside the program uh, terminals, you can connect the programs onto the relay um, uh, and they can work together. Right? So you can cause the relay to operate with the program and so on. Or you can just have those program, uh, uh, program uh, terminals and the relay terminals to operate on uh, different, uh, just basically on the independent basis. Uh, relay, why would you want, why, uh, uh, how would you um, use the relay? Like, for example, if you have some other uh, device that you want to trigger uh, based on the condition, like, for example, um, uh, the alarm system can be interfaced with something that's called a door, ac uh, ac sorry, access control. So it could be connected to a magnetic lock on the door. So normally it would be normally closed and uh, you might want to have a condition when the system is armed, you want the magnetic lock to be on so the door would be locked. But as soon as you disarm the system, you might want to have that particular door to be sort of like open so you can you can operate that door uh, or you can have the relay connected to some other external device such as a noise maker or a strobe light that requires a little bit more power or a separate power or trigger something else so maybe some recording device to be turned on and send the signal uh, closed uh, basically a closed signal somewhere else then uh, you may uh, program the relay to flip um, based on an alarm condition or based on if the system is armed or disarmed or some other conditions as well. Okay. Uh, question here. So could you just uh, cut someone's power to disable the alarm or does it have its own power source? Yeah, good question. Thank you for paying attention. So the alarm systems, um, do have the battery backup and uh, uh, depending on uh, on number of the devices or active devices that the alarm system has installed and it has to power so a motion sensor will be an active device uh, which means that it requires power to operate a glass break detector is an active device which means it requires powers to operate a door contact is just a magnetic switch it does not require so power so it's a passive switch so it depends on how many keypads keypad is an active device of course because uh, it needs power to operate uh, depends on how many devices you have connected to that panel the battery might last so long now if you have this uh, panel connected to a monitoring station uh, then uh, if uh, the battery uh, carries on when the power is cut, uh, a signal is going to be sent to the monitoring station that the power has been cut, but 
nothing happened, nobody broke in. It's just the monitoring station knows that the uh, that the power has been cut off or the, or interrupted. Now, based on receiving that signal, the monitoring station could have instructions per client. Like for example, if you own certain type of business and you have your system monitored, uh, you may request from the monitoring station have a condition. If the power gets cut off, can you notify me immediately? Okay. Or just uh, uh, when the power gets cut off, then um, uh, then just basically you acknowledge that it has been cut off. Then maybe five minutes later it comes back on, and then again maybe in the morning you're going to receive a report, or maybe at the month at the end of the month you're going to receive a report or something like this. So it depends on how you set up your monitoring and the conditions with the monitoring station. Also, when the uh, when the battery goes down to a certain level, uh, then uh, again. Uh, the alarm system is going to send a signal to the monitoring station notifying uh, um, the monitoring station. And then based on that condition, they have uh, action to be taken, okay? Uh, based on your request. Okay? Uh, so yeah, so alarm systems uh, uh, are not required by law, but uh, it's a normal thing for alarm system to have its own battery backup or the battery, uh, yeah, the battery backup. Uh, for the power okay so uh so that's that's as far as uh, this part of the alarm system yeah. this is a paradox uh, uh board but uh you're going to see the same common elements with pretty much most of the alarm uh panels Okay, now we're going to keep moving towards the right here and then I'm going to just magnify a little bit here. Main board connections here. So here's the auxiliary and here is the bus. Remember we talked about the bus topology? Well, here's the bus of the alarm system. I'm just gonna move the other mouse because it just distracts my view here. Auxiliary, very simple. It's a 12 volt DC plus and minus. And this is to power up the devices such as motion sensors, glass break detectors, uh, or any kind of device that requires power, keypads, um, maybe some other external boards uh, to have more zones. And we're going to cover what zones are. So that is the power here. Now, here we have the green and yellow. Um, because uh, we're using the, some that's called a quad cable most of the time. Uh, quad cable is being used. Uh, Z4 um, is the type of a cable. Or in the States, they will be calling the Z4. Uh, so Z4 is a, is a untwisted straight cable, and it's the old type of uh, co uh, color coding, which would be uh, uh, red and green and black and yellow. How, Ever in the uh, security business, it just kind of happens that um, for the most part, we're going to use black and red for the power, which we're going to connect this uh, to the auxiliary uh, terminals right here. And the green and yellow for that, uh, for the active device, for the bus part, we're going to use for the uh, data or the communications on that. So over here, this would be connected to any kind of a smart device, such as keypad or an expansion board that requires any kind of device that requires data flow between the devices. And keypad, of course, requires data flow between uh, the main board and the um, itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, and it's uh, basically done in a bus type of configuration. How is that accomplished? Um, it's as follows. I'm just here, wipe it wet, wipe it dry, so I can write on it. Uh, so when you have uh, the, uh, the bus terminals here, so those terminals are going to go all along. And uh, when you have a keypad, you would connect the keypad just like that. And then you have maybe another keypad. Also, you're going to connect it just like that. 
maybe somewhere down the road or down the cable line, you're going to have something like an expand. So there'll be keypad, keypad. Or you can have more than one keypad. Maybe somewhere there, you're going to have expansion board uh, because uh, you need more zones uh, or more, yeah, we're gonna talk about what zones are. Then uh, you are going to also connect that in this way, all right? So this would be the data flow or the signal or data communications. All right? So this would be uh, this would be uh, green and yellow and yellow. Then, because uh, every uh, the cable that we're using is 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 uh, four conductor straight untwisted cable. Uh, then it's also going to have black and red and red, and that goes into the uh, minus and plus uh, of the auxiliary of the auxiliary connection here. Yeah. So that's how we connect the um, this part of the alarm system. Next, then, okay, let's just go back a little bit here. We're going to take care, uh, take a look at this part, this part of this here. That's where the zones are happening here, okay? So let's go. All right, what do we see here? This basic setup for most of the alarm systems by most of the companies, they're going to come in sort of like eight zone type of a configuration. What is a zone? Zone is a circuit that can be interpreted uh, as, um, well, a zone of a, of a, um, of a alarm system. So what can be a zone? A zone could be uh, one circuit that takes care of, let's say the front door. So the front door could be connected to zone one. How do we connect that? The front door is going to utilize something as a, that's called a door contact, which is basically, it's a dry contact. Um, it's, it consists of, it consists of one sort of tiny box that is going to have a switch. And it's going to consist also of a magnet. You bring the magnet close to that switch, and it's called a reed switch. What is a reed switch? A reed switch is a switch that when you have a magnet close to it, it is going to operate. Now, most of the time you're going to have normally open contacts, but sometimes you may request to have normally closed contacts. So uh, if you take the magnet away, normally open contact is going to stay open. If you bring the magnet close to it, it's going to close. Right? Normally closed, at the idle state is going to stay closed. When you bring the magnet to it, it's going to open. Also, you have a double kind of a condition switches. So you have three terminals and depending on how you want to connect that, uh, uh, you know, you got the freedom of connecting it different, uh, in different ways. So that door con it's, it, um, it just so happens that uh, those are being called door contacts. Even though you can put them on windows or doors or something else, uh, that requires you to bring the magnet close to, to that switch. Commonly, they're called door contacts and they just, sorry, uh, DC will be a DC. It doesn't stand for the DC type of a current, it stands for door contact when it comes to alarm terminology. Okay. So, zone one could be programmed or could be uh, considered to be a front door for example. 
Now, zone two could be the garage door or the overhead door. Or zone two could be the maybe a window, right? Um, or something else that requires a door contact to be installed. Uh, then zone three could be maybe garage overhead door. Zone four could be um, a motion sensor. Then zone five could be maybe a glass break detector. Zone six could be uh, another set of windows because I'm going to show you how this, these things are connected. Basically, in an alarm system, you are connecting, you're making a closed loop, all right? From the common, through the contact, into the zone, all right? Or from the common, through another type of a sensor, into another zone. So depending on the condition of the zones, whether they're going to be open or closed, the alarm system panel is going to recognize the condition and react in a certain way that we want it to react. All right. Um, here's a question. Uh, are these contacts directly wired into the alarm system or do they work wirelessly? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, there are two different type of contacts. Some of the contacts uh, are wired directly, and that's the best way of doing things. But in some cases, you're going to encounter a situation that it's hard to pull a wire to the location. Maybe uh, the house has already been built um, and uh, just painted, and they want the uh, you know uh, they want some alarm system. Uh, and you just can't pull the wire to the door or without causing some major damage that needs to be fixed. So then you can use the wireless contacts. Uh, but by saying that, I'm going to say uh, the wired contacts are the best because they do not require any batteries to operate. And um, you have a direct connection. Uh, that means you cannot cause any interference. Um, to, uh, to make them stop operating or reacting properly. Okay? So uh, yeah, so there, there, there are options. However, the wireless technology in alarm systems has gone uh, quite far from what it was maybe like 25 years ago, uh, then the, to the point that the wireless contacts are pretty good. Uh, there could be wireless dark contacts or there could be wireless motion sensors right, as well. Uh, <clears throat> Not too often you're going to see something that's called a wireless glass break detector. Uh, however, some of the wireless door contacts have external terminals that uh, if you bring the magnet to the device, the, you can get another circuit out of that door contact, the wireless door contact. And based on whether this, those two terminals are shorted or opened by the wired magnetic contact, uh, you can send the signal to, uh, to the main panel. Quite often what I have done in the past uh, was, uh, for example, in a residential setting, I would be, uh, like, for example, there would be a garage, those garage overhead doors that need to be on the security alarm, but it would be a difficult, it would be a difficult thing to, um, uh, to run a wire from the overhead door through the garage into the house. So what I would do is I would install a wireless door contact and I would disable the magnet part of it, uh, but I would just program this thing to react to the opening or closure of the external screw terminals. And from here, I would run the wires along the wall to the contacts that are kind of a little bit differently made, uh, a little bit more tough, uh, that would accommodate the garage doors, right? And then I would make a closed loop between those two and have that. So when the two garage doors are closed, the whole loop is closed. That wireless contact is going to communicate with the panel saying, yeah, those two contacts are closed. As soon as you open one of them, you break the loop, the wireless contact sends, uh, you know, so you can have combination of both. Uh, all right, so now you see you only have few common terminals, and these common terminals are 
same as far as electrically wired. Okay, it's, it's, it's a hard connection between these three common, and they are dispersed in the zone um, structure here. Uh, so you have so many zones and they could be tied into the any of those commons because electrically it's the same uh, it's the same point all right so basically the thing is to 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 make the system recognize the condition between a zone and a common and most of the time you are going to have a condition that is normally closed you're going to have a, a sensor that is going to be normally closed, that means the condition is idle. And when it opens, then the system is going to react to it by either displaying on the display that something is opened, or when this thing is when the system is armed, then you the system is going to react to it when the zone opens. Okay. Now, so for, for the most part, it's going to be just a closed loop. Uh, there are different ways of sensing the zones with the security alarm. You can also have normally open, but it is very rarely uh, happening. However, you can have fire alarm or fire sensors connected to the alarm system. Like, for example, you can have one of the zones to be connected to a heat detector that is placed somewhere by the furnace in the basement. So then it's going to be programmed as normally open because uh, heat detectors are, or the fire alarm detectors are normally in the normally open uh, state. <coughs> Excuse me. And the security alarm sensors are mostly in the normally closed. Also, there's a third option that sometimes you can have an end of line resistor uh, connected to a zone and usually it's like uh, 47 kilo ohms uh, end of line resistors but some systems might request some other uh, resistance but usually it's 47 kilo uh, so basically what the zone wants to see it wants to see that 47 kilo ohm resistance in that loop and if it's anything else then the condition is going to be treated as not normal right? so if it opens then it's going to enunciate that there's a trouble there's a break in the line or when it closes it's going to say okay it's an alarm condition uh, so something like that. So yeah, there are different uh, ways of accomplishing the hardwired zones. And if you're a burglar, which I'm pretty sure we don't have any um, in our class. Any other any burglars here? Uh, sorry. Is there a burglar in the house? Okay. <laughs> it's Friday. Uh, okay. Um, so that's that with the zones. Now, here is another connector here and in this board is it is around here it's a serial port this is the port that you connect a device that requires a serial communication sometimes you're going to connect a serial interface to it, and it has a certain, it's, 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 it's a connector, and it has the same uh, plug, uh, just like the footprint of this connector. And the serial interface lets you communicate between this panel and let's say your laptop. Because quite often with so much to program in the security panels right now, it's better to use a laptop with the GUI or graphic uh, user interface um, that you can just call up the software and adjust the, the whole program, the whole system for zoning and uh, user codes and uh, whatnot. Uh, and then you can save it and if you need to uh, you need to re replace the main board for whatever reason, you can just call up the programming and just upload it instead of 
programming the whole thing all over again. Okay? Yes, you can program the systems through the keypad, but uh, I would say with the complexity of the alarm systems these days, it is just better to use the laptop interface uh, with that. So that's where you plug in the serial interface because it's a serial communication um, signal and you connect the other side of the serial interface to your USB port and then you make your laptop connect to the alarm panel. Also with the serial interface in some cases is being used just to connect other pieces of equipment such as IP module or sort of internet protocol module uh, that uh, you're going to plug in one side of that into the serial port here. And the other side, you are going to have just an ethernet jack. So you can plug it into your router or modem uh, or whatnot. Okay. And then if you want to program that, if you, if you plug it into a switch, for example, uh, you can bring your laptop and you don't have to plug it into the serial interface you can just plug in your ethernet cable from the ethernet port into the same switch and just make a connection with the panel through the switch. So that's, uh, that's, that's the serial interface. What else do we have here? Ah, oh, we do have the backup battery here. Now here is the seven, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. You will be able to see it once you download this. Um, Uh, so here, my questions probably make me sound like like one like what <laughs> like a battery backup? No, I'm glad you're asking the questions. I probably... <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, um, no, I'm glad you're paying attention here. Okay. Uh, now here's the battery. That these are the batteries. There are dry cell batteries makes basically means that they're sealed. You don't want to have any batteries in around electronic equipment, such as uh, PA systems or phone systems or alarm systems or, or security or fire alarm systems or any other thing that is not sealed because you don't want any vapors here happening from that. So this is the uh, gel uh, gel cell or sealed cell battery and basically it is connected and left in the panel this one is seven amp hours and uh you know you're going to have questions from clients okay because there, there, there are other batteries that they, they, they look like half the size of that and they're i think they're four and a half amp hours which means the seven amp hour battery uh, is able to keep one amp for seven hours or seven hour, seven amps for one hour or whatever the proportions are. Okay. Now, some of the clients are going to ask you, all right, so when I get this battery, how long is that going to last? Well, you don't know because you don't know whether um, you have one motion sensor, two motion sensors, or 17 motion sensors, or glass breaks, uh, keypads, how much do they communicate with the panel, uh, and so on, and how much communication is going on, how much activity is going in, so the whole thing just works. Um, well, you, you don't know. It's going to make it last for a little bit, and the best thing is to have this thing monitored so the monitoring station can receive the signal and notify you of that or send uh, authorities to your house right and wake you up in the morning yeah hey, alarm has trip something like that um okay so this is the battery backup and it's uh you can see the here is a, there's a fuse here right so sometimes when uh, people would plug in the battery in the reverse this thing is basically plugged in and left, but sometimes uh, I've seen technicians by accident, uh, uh, it happens, plug in the battery backwards. So of course the fuse is just going to blow here and you just replace the fuse. Right? It's protected by a fuse. All right, now let's see burglar alarm. Um, um, this is called magnetic sensors, right? Security system, burglar alarm, wiring for powered and magnetic sensors, okay? 
All right, so here would be a dark contact, a typical dark contact. So here would be the read switch, R-E-E-D switch. And it would be connected to a zone. So you see, mostly you're going to use the green conductor of the four conductor cable. Those red, black and red are not drawn here, but trust me, they're there. Uh, the green, most of the time, you're going to connect to the common um, and the yellow is going to be connected to the signal. So it's the general rule of doing things. But sometimes it's, it's uh, if you connect it backwards, it's not going to make a difference uh, physically or electrically because it's a dry contact. Okay. So those there's no power going on here well, as, uh, aside from that zone providing just a tiny bit of power here or voltage just to make sure that it's sensing that so it's just like using an ohm meter yeah? also provides a little bit of power but uh, this a, it's it's a, it's a, this is considered a dry contact so when you close that uh, this thing is going to sense the closure so this would be a normally open circuit uh, and you're not going to use the auxiliary power for that because it's just a dry contact opening and closing and this zone circuitry is sensing that Okay. Then uh, we have another way of doing this thing. So here's a normally closed or normally open a window sensor or a door contact. Okay. And these are considered to be passive devices because they do not need to be powered to operate. It's just a magnet uh, being closed. So this would be installed on the, if it's a door situation, this would be this, this part here because it's wired would be installed in the door frame, and this would be installed on the door. So when you open the door, you're removing the magnet from underneath that, and that thing triggers. Over here, a single normally closed sensor with an end of line resistor, right? So it would be a closed loop, and you would be putting the resistor in series with end of, uh, at the end of the line. Okay? So usually the resistor should be put in, the resistor should be put in right by the contact, not by this uh, um, here, because sometimes people would just put a resistor right across here, right across these two connectors. Yes, it's going to work, but it's going to be functional. No, because if this line is break, is if this line breaks, usually the purpose of installing the resistor, end of line resistor, is to make sure that the system knows when the line is broken. But if you install the end of line resistor here, yes, the system is going to work, but it will have no way to tell if the line is broken or not. Okay. Other uh, reasons sometimes the end of line resistors are being installed because you can double zones. You can, uh, you can have two zones in one zone. So one zone is going to be acting as a closed loop and the other zone is just a dry contact, a dry contact, zero ohms without the resistor. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other zone, the other uh, sensor can be put with the end of line resistor and the system can be programmed to distinguish these two circuits. So then you can have two zones put on one set of terminals. That is also possible if you want to double the zones. Okay. Motion sensors. Okay. Uh, these are... Um, uh, well, then you can uh, you can click on these here to to uh, to actually see more in uh, more info if you want. But that's basically what a common uh, motion sensor looks like. Okay? What do we have here? We have two sets of wires going on. One is the black and red, and that has to be polarized properly. Uh, to power up this device because this has electronic circuitry, so it has have to be powered. Then you're going to have the yellow cable conductor, sorry, conductor going to the zone part, and the other one's going to go to the common. All right. So it the system is going to look for the closure. And now you see the motion sensors we have normally open or normally closed. So normally it's going to be connected usually to normally closed to have the closed loop. So the zone sees a closed loop and uh, the common, and then uh, the auxiliary. So this auxiliary, it would go and it'd be connected parallel in a parallel way to all the devices that require power. And as long, it, it, should be, it should be fine as long as the power consumption but all the by all the devices combined 
does not exceed the capability of the power that uh, power the capability of this, this panel. It can only provide so much and the specifications vary based on the company or the board that you're going to have. Uh, but most of the time, if you have five, six, seven motion sensors, you should be fine. But you should read the power consumption of the device that you're installing, every device, add the, add the consumption, and then compare it to the overall ability to provide the power by the, you know, you do the math. Okay. If you exceed the amount of power required, then you can install an additional power expansion board. Okay. And that's also, you know, it's, it's, it's just a separate panel with just the power and its own backup battery as well. So that's what, uh, now uh, there's another, uh, uh, okay, so here's 12 volts ground, red and black. There's a common here that goes to the, common on the other side of the uh, wire, which goes to the board, normally closed or normally open, but normally is going to use normally closed. And then there's a TAMP, what does that stand for? That stands for tamper switch. You can put that if you want in series with this whole loop. So when somebody takes the cover off, the tamper switch kicks in and it breaks the loop. So we also can, Sometimes those things are being installed, sometimes not. It's not a requirement in most cases. However, in some situations, it could be actually a requirement to have the tamper switches uh, in loop with the, with the zones. All right, how is the wiring set up? Here is the zone, one of the zones. So one of them will be common, the other one would be the zone number or whatever it is. You can connect, if it's a closed loop, can you connect things in series with taking off the cover set off the sensor either way? Would, uh, wouldn't take it? Um, no, because if, uh, well, that depends on the device. If the, if the device is made that way, uh, it's a highly secure device, uh, yeah, it's going to trigger. But if you're the bur burglar, you don't know how this thing is wired. <laughs> So don't go breaking in <laughs> to places. Um, now, this loop is a closed loop. So can you put devices in series? Yes, you can. You can have, like, for example, if you have three windows that open uh, in the same proximity, you could have the living room windows just to save the zones amount, uh, you know, because you run out of zones when you install the security alarm. Can you connect three of those windows in series and then connect them into one zone loop? Yes, you can. You can have a motion sensor here and you can have a, a door contact or you can have just two of those to accommodate two garage doors and so on. As long as you close the loop, and this thing is not the uh, overall length of that. It's not, uh, you know, something ridiculous like, uh, you know, half a kilometer or something like that, because just the resistance of the wire is going to start adding up and play a role in that case. And uh, your system might not recognize the conditions, okay? So yeah, so sometimes you can, uh, you know, so things are being wired in series and most, for the most part, the alarm system is looking for a closed loop. Security alarm, okay. Sensors, types of sensors will be motion sensors, uh, door contacts, which we covered, glass break sensors. This is this is an interesting part. Uh, it re it requires well, it's it senses breaking off the glass. So if somebody breaks the window, um, the alarm triggers. Now, the, 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 the interesting way that the glass break sensors work is uh, they sense uh, some conditions. Okay? And this is the way a glass break sensor should work. It should sense three conditions. It should sense the high pitch sound of the glass shattering just as it breaks. And pretty much almost at the same time, it should see the lower frequency rumble and pretty much at the same time is going to sense a sudden pressure change in the room 
with those three conditions are present, this thing is going to trigger and cause an alarm. Why do we have that? Well, let's say um, you leave the house and you go somewhere and you arm the house and there's a storm going somewhere. So the, uh, the storm can have a uh, high pitched sound, but most of the times you're going to have a low frequency rumble. If not all the frequent, or not all the conditions are present, it's not supposed to react. Because if it reacts when it's not supposed to react, you're going to have something that's called false alarm condition. And the monitoring stations don't like that. And uh, when they dispatch security or police force that, definitely they don't like that. Okay? Some, it goes by city. Sometimes in the cities, uh, they would uh, react to for the false alarms. Uh, and uh, in some cities, they will give you a, uh, two times the charm and the three times you really have to do something about it and you have to pay money for them to actually react to your alarms or in some cases uh, in some cities the bylaws say that uh, every false alarm you pay a fee if it's a false alarm it costs you money for us to come over uh, it depends on the you know, so so you don't want to have false alarms yeah? uh, so um, or if you have um, <clears throat> let's say a cat that works around and you forgot uh, that you put like a glass of water or something on top of the counter and the cat goes on the counter, knocks the glass uh, on the floor. It breaks, but there's going to be that high frequency pitch sound of glass shattering, but there is not going to be that uh, low frequency rumble uh, and there's not going to be sudden pressure change. So uh, that's how the glass breaks, uh, glass break sensors work. Okay. Smoke detectors, uh, no, uh, uh, could it run like a fiber? Have light running through? Yes, there are different types of sensor. Oh yeah, um, there would be uh, fiber optics or, uh, or, or or LEDs transmitting signals and receiving things. And if somebody breaks that uh, light path, yes, you know, you know, there, there are different types of sensors, yes. Okay. Uh, glass break smoke detectors detect smoke. And in some cases, uh, if your um, um, facility requires a fire alarm being installed, in some cases, the inspector will let you have an alarm system with the elements of the fire alarm or the security alarm with the elements of the fire alarms. What I mean by that, you can have a security alarm with the fire alarm sensors connected to it and connected to the monitoring station. So the monitoring station is going to be notified and they will have that thing on their file in the computer program that uh, if zone number three triggers, that means it's a fire detect, a smoke detector, all right? <coughs> or a heat detector. Sometimes you want to install the smoke detectors. Sometimes you want to install the heat detectors. Um, depending on the conditions of whatever the environment is and what you want things to be triggered as. Mostly around the furnace rooms, a heat detector is a better idea than a smoke detector. Around upstairs in the bedroom, a smoke detector is a better idea to be installed. Uh, there are carbon monoxide detectors and uh, what is the other one? Um, CO2 uh, uh, detectors as well. Uh, that uh, that can be interfaceable by having a dry contact, uh, not just making a noise, but can be interfaced. Uh, there would be uh, water level uh, sensors. Uh, and those water level sensors usually are being connected to the sump pumps of the uh, in the house. And those uh, could be connect, those zones could be programmed in a way that the system does not have to be armed for that thing to trigger an alarm. Because most of the time, if it's a burglar alarm, then you don't want uh, the, the system to go into the alarm state uh, when you're in the house and you're just walking back and forth through the front door. But if you're out, then you're going to arm the system. And yes, you want the system to react uh, when uh, when somebody comes in that you don't want them to come in, right? So that zone is going to only trigger into alarm condition 
when the system is armed. You put the code in and you arm the system and you leave the house or the facility. Okay? But some of the zones, like for example, a fire loop, and the zones can be programmed, okay? Like a delay zone or a regular uh, instant reaction zone or a um, 24 hour uh, kind of a monitored. Uh, so the delay zone will program because uh, when you enter to the front door, you want to have a little bit of time to punch in the code. Usually it's programmed to be 30 seconds, but it can be changed, okay? Uh, so that's a delay zone because you don't want this thing to be go into alarm system right away if you come to your own house, right? Uh, so usually those will be at the, by the front door, right? Uh, now there will be an instant reaction zone. This, they would be um, on the glass break detectors. They would be on the window detectors and some other doors that you don't usually come in when you enter your house. So it'll be, uh, you know, no 30 second delays needed for the system to go into the alarm state. Uh, so yeah, um, you want that thing to be in, uh, triggered instantly. And then there would be those 24 hour uh, all conditions alarm. So that would be a smoke detector or a heat detector or some pump detector uh, level. So if the, you know, in, in, in the basement, in the sump pump, where the sump pump is, if the level goes up, maybe your sump pump stopped working for some reason or malfunctioning, <clears throat> excuse me, you can have the detector there, sensor, so if the water level goes too high, you want things to be notified, okay? Uh, so that would be um, basically a constant loop, constant monitored loop, all right? Uh, water level seismic detectors, uh, those usually are installed. Um, uh, the most common application would be saves in the bank, okay? or vaults. Uh, if somebody is trying to break into a safe or drilling into it, it's going to detect vibrations. And yeah, it's going to, you know, things are going to trigger. And trust me, when that happens, so you're going to have police and all kinds of uh, forces uh, within seconds. <laughs> uh, then there's panic buttons. Uh, these are the mechanical buttons that uh, usually are installed in highly sensitive areas. Uh, when there are people who are dealing with public and there could be some trouble, somebody you know might want to kind of beat you up or something like that, uh, then you're going to press the panic button. And usually those are silent alarms. Okay? Then uh, all those, most of the sensors can be configured uh, in the wired or wireless configuration here. Uh, now, when it comes to annunciators, there will be a bell, bell or that will be a silent uh, siren. Okay? Um, 30 watt siren, that's pretty loud, let me tell you, okay? Uh, sometimes people get 14 watt siren uh, uh, and the 30 watt siren. I usually get the louder ones, okay? Because, you know, when this thing triggers, uh, yeah, you want, the, you want the burglar to leave the house. You know? um, then uh, some alarms considered to be silent. So, you know, if somebody walks into some sort of facility and the alarm triggers, you don't want them to know that the alarm triggers. You just want the cops to show up, to show up and get that person. <laughs> so that would be a silent uh, uh, systems. All right. And then uh, interfacing. All right. Let's go to controls. The control, the alarms panels can be controlled by the keypads, laptop or such, uh, or could be controlled by the IP interface. Um, they, can, they can be connected to a IP module and they can get the communication through the IP instead of a phone line. Uh, they could have remote access, usually through the IP, and they could have wireless remote control. So for example, uh, instead of arming the system with the keypad, you might want to have a remote control and just, just like arming your car. Right? The advantage of that is that you can just go to your bedroom for the night, arm the system if you don't have a keypad in the bedroom, and you can go to sleep. Um, so that's, uh, or the other way of uh, using the remote control is that if you come to your house and if you just feel that something is not right, um, then you're just going to make sure that the system is armed. And if somebody is there, they're going to move and they're going to trigger the alarm. So that's you know, different ways of using the remote control of that uh, on what the, with the uh, security alarms, okay? Now, interfacing, um, 
the systems can be interfaced with different things. A, a system, a security system through the relays and the program buttons, it could be interfaced uh, with access control. So uh, that's a very common thing, especially when installing systems with um, uh, real estate agencies. <clears throat> Just think about it, the real estate agents, uh, agencies, they would have a relatively small facility with few cubicles, maybe and a couple offices or whatnot, uh, but they would employ maybe 80 agents. So you're not, wanna, you're not going to cut 80 keys for everybody and then somebody quits, you wanna you know, change the logs and give everybody a key again. Uh, so uh, you would have the alarm system interface with the access control, which would be basically a, a, a card reader by the door and everybody gets a key fob or a card and they swipe the card in order to disarm the system or get in or get out, whatever. And if somebody quits, you just take that card or the number, you deactivate that card and you give somebody else. You know, so it's, it's, access control is a pretty common thing to be interfacing with the... You know, also, the fire alarms and the security alarms can work together as well. Uh, this fire alarm can, can have actually one zone set up and it could be getting a relay signal from the security alarm. Okay, uh, so they're, they're inter and of course, they're interfaced with monitoring stations and some other whatever other equipment that is not invented yet, or maybe it is and we just we don't know about, okay, maybe some on Mars. All right now, cable that's being used, uh, it is Z4. And before we stop here, do we have another? Um, yeah, we're going to continue uh, next week with that. Uh, the <clears throat> cable that's being used, just one last thing I'm going to leave you with, is the cable that is being used for the alarm systems. You want to have a cable that is not twisted. Like if all the communications, twist helps with the crosstalk. But for the alarm systems, you want a cable that is not twisted. You want a straight cable. The reason for that is that if you twist a pair, that twist along the, along the pair that's twisted is acting, it has a coil or inductor properties. What do inductors not like? Inductors do not like change. Any sudden change, the inductor is going to oppose, and then it's going to give in. Right? So if you have a longer piece of wire going from one zone to the front door, if somebody opens and closes the door very quickly, that inductor might actually block that change and the signal is never going to get to the zone. And the, the system will never know that this thing has, is supposed to trigger. So you want straight cables. But then again, those alarm systems produce so much noise, all right? Really a lot of noise because there's a lot of communication going on between those wires. Even if it's just a zone contact going to the door, you put the toner probe right beside that wire, you're going to hear all kinds of noises. So that's why the alarm cables should stay away from the data cables when we do that, all right? So uh, that's as far as, okay, one last question here and then before we let go, uh, I wanted to ask if I could come into the lab Monday afternoon. One, two, three, I forgot to take a picture. Yes, you can just let me know that this is what you're doing. And the only condition that has to happen is that there cannot be more than 10 people in our room because our room is rated for 10 people. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, uh, usually we we are okay with, uh, uh, you know, I just have to say that. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to continue with this uh, next week uh, because we're going to have to uh, uh, cover the, uh, fire alarms, just a little bit of an overview, and we're going to have to cover the security surveillance, which will be the camera systems. But for now, I'm going to see you when I see you, and stay safe and healthy, and all that good stuff. I'll talk to you later. Thank you.